I grew up near this beach here and over there we have rocks going up onto the beach this is where my father used to take me and he used to show me all the little critters under the rocks and so my father introduced me to looking around and searching for animals he introduced me to field naturalism I'm planning an art piece that combines my love of wildlife with the nostalgia of cereal toys I'll meet some weird looking critters along the way get some close encounters with some dangerous venomous animals and then have a close encounter with the world's most deadliest octopus all in the name of art. As a child it was always fun to find a toy in your cornflakes. And here's one of my favourites, Slugsy. As I look at my Neptune C band from the 1960s I'm sure that a lot of the appeal is that they were wildlife. Beneath the waves is another secret world where I would imagine all sorts of things were possible. The rock pools are a window to this strange world. So I'm playing around just drawing some of the characters from the cereal here and just imagining them. What would they be like if they were actually real creatures? I think it's sort of an interesting play on the whole idea of that these are so sort of like cartoon characters which is sort of like almost you know cartoon characters often make fun of real life things but then when you sort of turn it around it's like I'm doing almost like a parody now I'm actually doing real animals almost making fun of the breakfast cereal toys just playing with a bit of colour here still deciding what sort of work of art I'm going to do and I don't know if I really like the colour I'm thinking now that I might make the whole thing a black and white piece in which case I would probably use um, a lino cut because of that boldness so just doing a little black and white sketch here it does look a lot better and I think that's what I will stick with of the lino. So the boldness of the lino gives you the feeling of like comics, um, bold illustrations, exploring the idea of nostalgia which is an interesting one. Why do we feel nostalgic about things? Does it remind us of a of a different time in our life? I suppose this reminds me of a time in my life where I didn't have to pay taxes or power bills or water bills or rent or rates just this nice feeling when you look at something that's familiar from from many years ago. This is where I used to live uh, in the seventies. I used to grab my plastic bucket, I used to walk this way down to the beach. As a teenager, I would walk this way to get to the beach. Now, I sort of lived in what was a suburban area that started to get more and more built up. Today, if I walk down the beach, there's just houses and cement everywhere. But this place used to look much more like this here. Here we have just like swampland, lagoons, right next to the beach. So I had to walk past here, and this is where I used to find some very exciting creatures. I used to see green frogs and snakes. At the time I wasn't quite sure what they were. I used to look in my books and I used to think, I think that's a copperhead. These days I know it was a copperhead. So walking from my suburban house down to the beach, retracing my footsteps, I had to walk past a swamp and in this wonderful swamp uh, one of the things I noticed were these beautiful green frogs uh, where there are now houses there used to be a row of tea tree and then there used to be this body of water there and you see these frogs out in the middle of the day basking it's one of the only type of frogs that will bask and it's called Latoria raniformis 
Now I don't normally use scientific names. Uh, so it's called the big green golden bell frog, it's called the growling grass frog. The problem is it's got a dozen different names and that's why I just tend to call it Raniformis. Just here where we've got all these houses, back in the early 70s, late 60s, early 70s, there used to be a field here, a little paddock, and through there used to be a drainage ditch. And in that ditch we used to find Raniformis big green bell frogs. Unfortunately that's all being drained, there's nothing but houses here, behind them more houses, all the way down the beach, nothing but houses. Uh, so Raniformis is locally extinct in this area, which is a bit sad. So we have to go 20 kilometres that way before we start seeing Raniformis again. So this beautiful green frog here gets to quite a size. Like I said, one of the only frogs that bask in the sun and it will eat almost anything. So the small snakes when they're first born, they could end up as a meal to the Raniformis. The Copperhead, um, again, scientific name, Australaps superbus. Like I said, don't normally use scientific names unless it can get confused with something else. And every time I've made a video about copperhead, people say, that's not a copperhead, that's not a copperhead. Well, it is. It's an Australian copperhead. It's a common name for a snake called Australapsin superbus. In America, there is another snake called copperhead. Completely different species, different genus. The copperhead is a beautiful snake. It's nice and slender. It likes to live around swampy areas. It likes to eat frogs. In Tasmania, wherever you hear a frog calling, you know there's a possibility there could be a copperhead nearby. The genus of the copperhead is an leopard, means front fang snakes. These guys give a dose of neurotoxin that can kill. Although it's extremely rare for anyone to get bitten by the copperhead because it's not a very bitey snake. Uh, it's a very timid snake. They're very skittish, it will try and get out of the way, it will not try to attack you. When I walk down to catch the creatures in the rock pool, I'd often see these guys, the copperhead. At the time I was a child, I was too frightened to go near them, uh, because they are extremely venomous. A bite from this could kill a person. These days, not so scared, but isn't it an absolutely beautiful animal. Again, although as a child I was walking past these venomous animals, they were venomous but they weren't dangerous. They just went on their own way. When I let this guy go, you probably see that it's just going to rush away from me. Okay, let's pop it down here. Lay it out <clears throat> and see, there it goes. So I'm planning a piece of art and in this art I am going to have sort of movement and elements of nostalgia as well as elements of wildlife. I'm not really just like a straight out wildlife artist. A lot of wildlife artists will just take photographs and just pretty much reproduce those photographs. I like to document experiences and feelings. So I want to have sort of feelings and experiences in my artwork. To me I find that much more interesting. And also I want to give a sense of movement and sound and music even if it's underwater. And so I'm just playing around with a few ideas here. And so usually I start off with rough sketches like this. I like doing swirly lines, which is probably why all these curves that I do. It's probably why I like doing snakes. The seaweed here, just to keep the whole composition. The two main figures I want is the fish here, blowing the horn like Slugsy. Then you got your half 
octopus here. And then probably a bit of kelp here. So it looks like there's a one, two, three things happening. This is in the foreground. Back here more. He might be sitting on a rock actually. Slightly elevated. So back here you've got another fish blowing a horn. Blowing a shell. I might sort of in funky sort of lettering here pop down. Uh, it must be about 1969 I'm guessing. Might be 60. Might be 71. 70. Oh, I'll find out. Poison and venom. The lino cut is a really tricky thing to do because you've got to think back to front. Any of the wording I have to put on here has to be back to front. And then you have to think in the negative. You're cutting away the white and you're leaving behind the black. This here is one of the critters I used to catch a lot as a child. Oh, he's almost got me too. Uh, this is a decorated crab or a spider crab. Oh, he's so close to getting me. And you see all that stuff on the back there? All this seaweed in there, he's actually snipped off and poked in. I know this because I kept them as pets and I watched them do it. I used to get a fresh bit of seaweed that snip it with their claws and they poke it on their back. That's why my fingers are in danger at the moment. He's a little bit larger than I normally see. But such a beautiful animal. Gorgeous. I'm going to pop him down before he nips me. Here you go little fella. He's got me. He's down like that. It just looks like a lump of seaweed in the rock pool. I've just searched here for the blue ring octopus, it's getting dark now, so I'm going to quit for the day. What I did find is some weird, bizarre looking sea slug creatures. I mean, these things were like straight out of a sci-fi movie, they were so strange. But apart from that, and a beautiful decorated crab, I'm going to have to come back probably when the sun's up and I have a bit more time to look for these guys. I'm going to try again tomorrow. that I found very early on as a child was the shore eel. Um, these ones here, there's a juvenile and an adult here and that's about as big as they grow. They don't grow much bigger than that. I loved it when I first caught one of these guys because it looks like a tiny little snake. So they're always uh, something that's very fond in my memory but they are found fairly common around the shoreline here in Tasmania. And I'm definitely going to pop this one in there. I'll just sneak it into this print somewhere, just because I love the shore eels. I have to have something snake-like in this print. Oh, 
Here's a sea star. Beautiful one that we call a biscuit star. Gorgeous, wonderful creature. I'll probably pop this one in my artwork as well. I might sneak him in there as part of the print. It's the underside. They're bizarre little creatures. Beautiful colours. Right, better pop him back where he belongs. I always like to set things back exactly where I found them. Gotcha! Oh. Look at him. So, as kids we used to call these catfish, but they're not catfish, we call them that because they have got these two little furry things above their head. Uh, it's actually a blenny. That's a fairly common fish along the shores line here. So these blennies here are one of the things that I used to keep as pets. I used to have a saltwater aquarium and in my early teens I'd be down the beach all the time finding interesting stuff to put in it. Trouble with these guys, those two guys are getting on well, but anything else you put in there these guys will eat and tear apart. They'll tear crabs apart, they'll sneak around behind them, they'll bite their legs off, bite them until there's nothing left of them. They attack small fish, they'll attack little prawns, they'll attack anything you put in there. So eventually I had to try and get all these guys out of the saltwater aquarium um, because they're just so vicious. These guys are the wolves of the rock pools. So these guys are definitely going in the, uh, in the lino cup. In fact I might make them sort of like a co-star in this. I was just going to let these guys go where I found them. There we go little guys. In some of these larger rock pools there's this mystery fish, I'm not quite sure what they are so I'll set up this GoPro to see what they are. So what these fish are are zebra fish and zebra fish have got such a funny front view they look really happy when they're looking straight at the camera. So I'm going to stick some of these guys in the background as well. They look like they're enjoying the music that the poison and the venom are making. So here we have one of the most poisonous uh, things in the sea. There's a big difference between venom and poison. And it's a very simple distinction. If you eat this guy you'll probably die. Because you get poisoned. Poison is something you consume. You get bitten by a blue ring octopus, you could die. That's venom. Venom is injected through a bite or a sting. So that's the clear easy distinction between poison and venom. These toadfish gorgeous beautiful things they've got these gorgeous wonderful colors eyes I love the 
the crazy sort of pattern, mottled pattern on their back. Um, they are part of the pufferfish family. If it's really stressed, it will just inflate itself and just look like a round ball. But usually these guys have to be very, very stressed to do that. This guy is actually chilling out. It's relaxing now, which is quite nice. That means I can sort of sketch with a fairly clear conscience that I'm not really upsetting him too much. But I shall release him very soon, so I'll make these sketches happen quite quickly. Well, it's great to do a sketch of this guy here. I'm going to release him now because he's getting a bit frantic in there. Beautiful animal, definitely going in the, in the print as one of the main characters. Okay, here you go. There he goes. decorated crabs. I'll definitely put at least one of these decorated crabs into the print that I'm doing. <laughs> they wonderful. I'll pop them back where they belong. So as a child I come down here and I look under these rocks. Uh, what we've got here are these beautiful rocks. There's seaweed all around. It's just prime habitat for a blooming octopus. It's probably as close as they come into shore. You have to go further out to sea to find any more. So every time I lift a rock I also try and put it back. The thing with the blue ring octopus, if the blue ring octopus bites a person, um, they can be dead in 15 minutes. So you haven't got a long time to get to the hospital. Uh, it's a very dangerous animal. And so this is why uh, as a child I was probably taking a lot more risks. But my father always said never put your hands where you can't see them and never put your hands in seaweed. I guess that was really good advice. Let's see what's under this rock. Alright, what I've got here is an elephant slug. See him moving along there? Might actually pop him in the print as well. Right, always pop the rocks back exactly the way they came up. Very gently. So I've got my blue ring octopus. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to sit down and do a few sketches of it um, and see how much of a good model this guy is. So I'm sketching these guys. I'm sort of picking up a few points here. And speaking of points, right on the back of their head seems to be like a point, a long point. Uh, probably more so than I would have expected in an octopus. And I also notice that the skin goes from smooth suddenly bumpy. It will suddenly be spiky all over. I tend to like that sort of spiky look. It looks very, very peculiar. The other thing I've noticed, and this is with all octopus, is there's two rows of suction cups. And it's always good just to visually see this so you know that the octopus has two rows of suction cups going all the way to the tip of the tentacle, all the way up underneath. It's amazing. So I've got a few sketches here, I've got uh, ideas on the, just behind the eyes, those funny breathing apparatus. I've got enough to try and work out how I'm going to do this lino cut and how I'm going to make the octopus look like it's playing the harp made out of its own tentacles. Anyway, that's enough of that. I'm going to let these guys go. Let's watch them sort of swim off. Got a few of them here now. There you go. Put these guys back where they belong. They are beautiful animals. They look like beautiful little toys. Yes, they are deadly if you get bitten by one. But if you're not going to harass them, you're not going to get bitten by one. So why not let these beautiful things live? All life is precious and beautiful. Bye, fellas. They're everywhere here now. You wouldn't want to go swimming there. But it has to be one of the most amazing, beautiful animals that I've ever played with, and one of the most deadly. 
and it just does look like a little toy. It is a gorgeous animal. When I print this, it often turns out very different from what I'm used to because it's like seeing something in a mirror. It's a mirror image of what you've actually drawn and carved away when you print it. There's a mirror image of it and it can look a bit different sometimes. So here's the print, it's called Venom and Poison because of the poisonous fish, the toad fish, gorgeous little fish and of course of the venom of the brewing octopus. Um, I sort of imagine this being like the rock pool band where they're getting together and playing. It's all just a bit of fun and I hope you guys have enjoyed uh, looking at me, having a bit of fun, being a bit nostalgic, uh, enjoying the toys and of course enjoying the wildlife.